Depleted uranium is a byproduct of the process used to enrich uranium to make nuclear weapons or fuel for power stations. Because of its high density and because it burns on impact, it's used in armor-piercing tank shells and bullets. The uranium is used in a dart at the core of the weapon. This is called the penetrator. Unlike nuclear weapons, uranium weapons do not cause damage by using radioactive fission. Instead, they rely on their high density and strength to pierce armor. Depleted uranium ammunition is fired by tanks, aircraft and armoured personnel carriers. When a depleted uranium penetrator hits a hard target, it burns, producing a radioactive and chemically toxic dust. Contamination can remain for years and the decontamination measures suggested by international agencies to protect civilians are technically challenging and require money and expertise. Money and expertise are often lacking in countries recovering from conflict and hazard awareness, monitoring and decontamination programs will compete with other priorities. The dust poses a threat to civilians, military personnel and peacekeepers. Contaminated vehicles often remain in populated areas or are removed to scrapyards where they are broken up and sold. Environmental contamination lasts for years after the conflict. Uranium from weapons can also find its way into drinking water wells. Abandoned vehicles are exciting places for children to play in. Young children, like pregnant women, are generally more susceptible to damage from uranium exposure. Inside the body, some of the dust will be soluble and can pass into the bloodstream. Other particles will not be soluble. If inhaled, these may lodge in the lungs for a long time, emitting radiation directly into the tissue. Other particles may be transported to the lymph nodes. Soluble uranium entering the bloodstream will be excreted in urine quite quickly. But before this happens, it can travel to many parts of the body. Uranium accumulates in the bones and other organs. Uranium in the bones could irradiate the bone marrow, potentially causing leukemia. Uranium has been shown to cross the placenta and the blood-brain barrier. Because of their rapidly dividing cells and developing organs, unborn children may be more at risk than adults. At a cellular level, uranium has been shown to be genotoxic, meaning it can damage genetic material, causing mutations and increasing the risk of tumors developing. In Iraq and the former Yugoslavia, where the weapons were used, it's been suggested that increasing rates of cancers and birth defects may be linked to the use of uranium weapons. Unfortunately, there have not been any large-scale studies on civilians which could settle the issue. Other pieces of the jigsaw show that there are serious reasons for concern. Veterans from conflicts where uranium weapons were used are ill. Although other factors are likely to have played a role too, many were in situations that could have exposed them to uranium dust. Laboratory studies show that depleted uranium's chemical toxicity and radioactivity can cause disruption at the cellular level with the potential to cause health problems. Workers and people living near a factory that made penetrators tested positive for depleted uranium's years after exposure, showing that uranium dust can be a long-lasting contaminant. Concerns about uranium weapons have been raised in the United Nations General Assembly and the European and Latin American parliaments. However, some international agencies, such as the World Health Organization, have declined to take a precautionary approach to the issue. This contrasts with the military in many countries, with soldiers now urged to take precautions and use protection in contaminated areas. 
Manufacturers and stockpilers of uranium weapons include the United States, the UK, France, Russia, China, and Pakistan. They argue that uranium weapons are so effective that they must be retained. However, humanitarian concerns must always come before military needs, both morally and under international humanitarian law. Uranium weapons are not currently banned by existing arms control laws. A specific treaty, similar to those for cluster munitions and landmines, may be required to explicitly ban them once and for all. A uranium weapons treaty could set a precedent for international law covering all toxic remnants of war, reaffirming that where there is a potential risk to civilians and the environment, a precautionary approach should prevail. When there is uncertainty, the burden of proof should be on the military to prove that there is no risk, rather than civil society having to prove that a weapon is harmful. It cannot be right that armies can deploy a weapon because they believe it is useful, while leaving civilians who have no choice in the matter at risk long after the fighting is over.